A wise man told me we are never given a dream without being given the power to make it true. You'll have to work for it, though. I'm Ron Schneider. Back in the 60s, I grew up around California theme parks, dreaming that someday I could make my living with that same kind of magic. In 1971, I got my first performing job at Magic Mountain. The 40 years that followed were one wild ride. And these are the stories of others who had that same dream and made it come true. Oh, hi there. Welcome to uh, Wild Rides. I'm Ron Schneider. Uh, when I was a kid growing up at Disneyland, I remember hearing the voice of Jack Wagner. He was the voice of Disneyland. He would announce parades, special events, ticket prices. Well, my guest today is slowly becoming the Jack Wagner of his time. He's a comic, an improv artist, uh, an actor. He is the Emmy-winning host of uh, Inside Disney Parks and the Disney Park live streams. That's Mark Daniel. Welcome, mm. Mark. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me. My <laughs> pleasure. Um, you started out in Trinidad and Tobago. Is that where you're from? I did, yeah. I'm an island man, as they say. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, my mom wanted more opportunities for kids. I have a brother, mm -hmm. a younger brother, and uh, she decided to move to America. And a good place to be, which is the climate is much like the islands, you mm -hmm. know, is Florida. It has, you know, your beaches. It's a little more humid here, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, uh, we all know what hurricanes are, both, both Trinidad and Tobago and yeah. Florida. We're familiar with that. Um, so she moved to Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she did. But uh, we weren't with her yet. So she, what she did is she lived there for a while. She had a sister in Anchorage, Alaska, which is a completely different climate. And... <laughs> We're not moving there. <laughs> but uh, what she did is she, she got a job there. Her sister was in the Air Force. And from there, she, got her, uh, she became a naturalized citizen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that, then she moved to Florida. And that's when we all came to Florida. And we moved officially from Trinidad and Tobago to the climate we all know, which is uh, sunny and breezy. And humid as heck. And humid as heck. <laughs> Were you a Disney fan growing up? Was, you, was that something you were interested in, or was it just generally performing? Uh, it was generally performing. Uh, being in Trinidad, I think my, in, the only thing I knew about uh, Disney was a little watch I had with Mickey Mouse on it. Uh -huh. So I knew Mickey Mouse was something. I didn't really grow up on Mickey Mouse cartoons, mm -hmm. but I think you... Uh, if you've never seen a Mickey Mouse cartoon, you know he's something. He's a little cartoon mm -hmm. mouse, and he's on watches, and he's on things. Mm -hmm. So you know he's somebody. Mm -hmm. um, my big connection uh, now with Disney, but I was I grew up a Muppets fan, so uh, mm -hmm. I would watch the Muppets show in Trinidad, you know, mm -hmm. on Thursday nights. So um, when I got to learn Disney, also the Muppets was also involved with Disney, so I kind of felt comfortable already because mm -hmm. I was like, I get the mayhem of the Muppets. Let me check out the mayhem of Disney. Mm -hmm. How old were you when the first time you visited the parks? I probably was about 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my aunt took uh, me and my cousins to uh, the Magic Kingdom. And we were one of those families that had no idea what was going on. You're just following the, mm -hmm. the people in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do remember is I rode the Haunted Mansion and it scared me because the voice told me a ghost would follow me home. <laughs> like I was cool. <laughs> like I'm riding it, I'm like this is nice, this mm -hmm. is scary. But when that final voice said, a ghost will follow you home. I remember brushing my teeth the next that night in the mirror. And you know, there's that mirror effect, right? Yeah. And I'm brushing my teeth and I could have sworn that little mad hat box or whoever he was popped up in the mirror. And I was actually spooked out. And, uh, and I do remember standing on the sidewalk and watching the electric light parade, which plays a very important role later on in my career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you started out uh, as a, um, a, a canopy bearer. Yes, yes, I was a canopy carrier was what they called them. So uh, I got my job at Disney, you know, I was in high school and uh, the way I got my job was uh, I, uh, they came to my school mm -hmm. and uh, I was like, hey, you know, I saw some, some, some parade uh, people. I said, I want to do that. And they said, well, you can. Mm -hmm. So I auditioned and I was so talented and I could dance so well, my job was to carry a canopy and not dance. <laughs> so, of course, I could not dance. But I carried a canopy for the electric light parade. I remember um, the Main Street electric light parade, and I remember that they had to train us. So I am backstage at the Magic Kingdom, uh, where all the floats are, mm -hmm. and I remember they said, okay, so here's how you're gonna walk. You have to walk to the beat, and you're gonna be walking between what they call floats. Mm -hmm. So I remember they said, okay, so we're gonna bring a float out. So I'm standing there and I'm holding the canopy and the snail comes out. You mm -hmm. know, so there's a snail, he lights up, he's got glasses on mm -hmm. and it drives out and it stops and they click the music on. Mm 
-hmm. And when they clicked the music on it, that boom, 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 literally, it took me back to when I was standing on Main Street at 12 years old, watching that same snail drive all lit up. And I, it hit me, and I was like, wait a minute. I'm in this parade that I saw as a, you know, for me, my first visit to Walt Disney World. And that, that's when the magic hit. I was just like, whoa, and now I'm doing this. So I had no idea what I was, that I was part of something I had seen and was entertained by. And suddenly now you're, you're on that stage. Mm -hmm. What was the most, for you, the most surprising thing about actually working in the parks versus your, your impressions as a guest? Mm -hmm. um, what is the thing that most surprised you? I think what surprised me the most was uh, the happiness of people, um, how people were excited to see any type of entertainment in a good way. You know, I think people taking pictures, like walking out of somebody who, you know, worked in a grocery store, the amount of people taking pictures of you in your costume, you know, carrying a canopy, the amount of people smiling at you and kids waving at you. I think that really stood out to me and I really felt like I was making people happy, you know, um, making them forget um, what was going on in the world. And I think that's the bug that bit me was I can entertain people and people are happy. I can see the happiness in their face and the smiles as you walk down the parade route and the fact that a little kid would be so excited that you just went, yeah, you know, and, and just seeing how easy it is to make people happy by being happy yourself. I think, I think that's what I noticed the most, you know, because the other end of it is walking through the parks, you're looking, you're busy, you're trying to find where you're going, you do an attraction that's awesome, now you're, you're looking at your map, you're trying to find food, but those moments stop you, and you have to stop and you have to watch the parade, and you enjoy it, and then you go back to, your, to try to find the next attraction. So. Those moments when an employee singles you out and just smiles and waves, yeah. is, is, it's a magic moment. Yeah, it's exactly. just a magic moment. Um, we'll come back to the, the Disney stuff. I want to know uh, when you started doing comedy. Mm -hmm. I started doing comedy uh, with um, a, a company called SAC Comedy Lab, mm. uh, pretty big in Orlando. Um, Wayne Brady came out of that, uh, mm -hmm. um, those comedy classes. I took, I took improv classes at SAC Comedy Lab as what was called a lab rat. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people um, that are writing for um, um, Saturday Night Live, um, Mad TV, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people um, came from SAC Comedy Lab. And they also were the uh, people that started the streetmosphere at, at Disney as we know it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially Disney's Hollywood Studios. So um, I started doing improv comedy in about like 95. And then my dream after I figured out what I wanted to do of entertaining people was to stand on stage and entertain people by myself, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that, that comes with the, the land of stand-up comedy, and that was my dream. So about 97, 98, I got enough nerve to, uh, to try stand-up comedy. Um, and I tried it because I watched one of my friends fail. Mm -hmm. I went to see him at the improv. They were doing open mic night, and he was horrible. He got booed off stage. Whoa! Um, but I knew him, and he was a funny guy, mm -hmm. and he got booed off stage, and it didn't kill him. He was, he was like, what'd you think? And I was like, uh, cool. And he's like, yeah, that was, that was good. And I was like, and I, no, no discredit to him. I knew I could be, I can get it and I could be funnier than he was. But what helped me with him is that the worst thing you could think is to be booed on stage mm -hmm. and he survived it and it didn't destroy him. Mm -hmm. And I think I found inspiration in his tenacity. Now you've been working off and off for Mickey for 26 years, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, you started out on the parade, but you rapidly started getting sucked into other things throughout the company, mm -hmm. a lot of different uh, jobs as a performer mm -hmm. and uh, as a, a communicator. Mm -hmm. um, any, f any favorite roles that you've done of, out of all those? Yeah, there was a lot. You know, when you work in, in entertainment like that, mm -hmm. um, you're... you're um, you don't really get promoted, but promotions come in the form of new experiences, mm -hmm. and they picking you. And Ron, you you know you can relate to this as much because you were also a performer at Walt Disney World. Mm -hmm. You know, so when new things come up, that's kind of your promotion. So I remember when I I did uh, I did the last season of the Electric Light Parade, mm -hmm. but then I got to do the brand new Spectral Magic Parade. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was state of the art with the lights changing. From there, I moved on to Disney's Hollywood Studios, which was Disney MGM Studios at the time. Mm -hmm. And their first ever parade was Aladdin's Royal Caravan. Mm -hmm. And this was huge for that part. Mm -hmm. Aladdin was successful. 
and they literally took a scene from the film and made these floats. And it was like the first time that, like Magic Kingdom had sections, you know, you could see the Jungle Book section, you could see a Pinocchio section, but to have a parade dedicated to one film mm -hmm. uh, was, was groundbreaking. Um, so I got to be involved in some of the first ever parades, like, uh, like I mentioned Aladdin, a Toy Story Parade, um, the Hercules Parade. Um, so those were some feathers in my caps. And finally moving into becoming an actor at Walt Disney World and being able to open Disney's Animal Kingdom. Uh, that was my biggest moment is to be, to be able to say, I opened a Disney theme park. I was in that theme park before any guests were there. I wore a hat, hard hat and I saw Michael Eisner walking around you know, looking at things. Um, and so that's the biggest, and finally, now in the end, the biggest franchise ever to be a part of the opening of Galaxy's Edge mm -hmm. and getting, getting to be a part of a character that is mentioned in canon, it's mentioned in, the, in, in books, and also to being in a land that doesn't exist in the films, but now it does. They, they mention Galaxy's Edge, which is Batuu, or Black mm -hmm. Spy Outpost. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned in books. It's mentioned in the films. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty surreal to be a part of, you know. What character were you? Uh, in, in, in for Star Wars? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a character called um, um, Kembe. Now, mm -hmm. Kembe is actually a role, so it's like master. Mm -hmm. So it's a master builder of lightsabers. So what we do is we work under the guise of when you go into Galaxy's Edge, you can go to Savi's and Sons, which uh -huh. is a junk area. Uh -huh. And he helps out the gatherers. And what the gatherers do is we search for um, broken lightsabers and kyber crystals and help uh, Jedi or Sith, if they want to build a lightsaber, we uh -huh. help you build it. So we're actually seeked out for people now that want to build lightsabers or want to join the resistance as uh, a Jedi uh -huh. or join the dark side as a Sith. The only way you can get lightsabers now is to kind of seek out the gatherers. So you're, are, you, are you a performer in the lightsaber experience? Yes, yes, oh, I am. Wow. I am. So you go to Savi's and yeah. Sons workshop, yeah. and it's uh, and then you can experience the whole process of uh, choosing your kyber crystal and mm -hmm. hearing the history of the lightsabers and, and getting to experience and building your own. I've heard wonderful things about that. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a it's an honor to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Were you, uh, were you ever part of the, Je the Jedi Training Academy? I was, yes, yeah. I was. I was part of a, the Jedi Training Academy, which is also an amazing show. Uh, another thing I was a, a part of was the first ever um, Star Wars Weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I know and, that. and Star Wars Weekends was a lot of fun. It was great to be a part of that. And, and uh, the Jedi Training Academy grew out of Star Wars Weekends. Mm -hmm. And now it's, uh, it's bi-coastal, mm -hmm. a show that's bi-coastal, and a show that gives kids an amazing way to experience Star Wars. I've so, seen that. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan. I love mm -hmm. the, the, little, the little girl who faces off against Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah. Is just the most charming thing you could see. It is. And I think when we learn the show, uh, you know, and as you can relate to this, Ron, when you mm -hmm. do shows, you can see how people react to them. You can see how people go back to their parents. And one thing I learned about the Jedi Training Academy, when you watch a child face off against Darth Vader or Darth Maul or mm -hmm. Sarge Ventress, the way they walk back to their parents is different. Mm -hmm. You can see they have a new confidence because they believe they faced off against those villains mm -hmm. and they conquered it and they had the support and they had the support of their parents in the car driving to Walt Disney World saying, you can do it. Don't be scared of Darth Vader. I believe in you. And then accomplishing it and walking back to their parents. I tell you, many of us stand backstage and watch the, the, the change, the posture in the kid. Mm -hmm. it's, really, it's really amazing. <laughs> After a while, the special event came up. I think it was Skeletoscope, and they wanted the Dreamfinder voice for that. And so I got to go down to Studio D, the recording studio underneath the, mm. the Magic Kingdom. And um, while I was there, I had the presence of mind to uh, screw around with them for a while, do a couple other voices. I did my imp impression of Jack Wagner, the voice mm. of Disneyland. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. And um, sure enough, I started getting voiceover work from them. And that led to my getting voiceover work outside the company. Now I do a lot of, uh, of uh, educational things, uh, English as a second language, textbooks, mm. and children's stories and love like that. I dearly love it. Mm. Um, and uh, I developed uh, a, a great skill of cold reading. I could pick up a text and yeah. give you a performance without having ever very seen it before. Very good talent to have in voiceover. Yeah, in this business it's a very yeah. good talent to have. What was it like, Ron? Like I noticed when I started doing voiceover work, especially at Disney, you're doing a lot of exposition, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of like, you know, the show's gonna begin, the lights will dim, stay seated, a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I noticed they would tell me to smile, to put that smile in my yeah. mouth. Is there anything that any little tools that you had, like I put a pencil in front of my mouth so I wouldn't pop my peas? What was that like? Like being like you, I was outside with guests, so you have a different energy, and now you're trying to bring that same energy in the sound booth. What were some of your tools to, 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 to accomplish that? The thing that I learned was you've got to imagine you're talking to someone who's sitting next to you in a car because that warmth, that proximity comes across. It changes the way you emphasize things. It changes the way you say things and, and um, it, it changes the power. And uh, as a result, like I did the, the Mickey's Birthday Land Express, the train that ran around yeah. to Mickey's uh -huh. Birthday Land. Well, I got to write and perform the train narration for mm -hmm. Mickey's Birthday Land Express. And um, I had to ride the train, taking down notes on what we saw and when we saw it and like this. And then when I went to record it, um, instead of sounding like a Disney voice, the, the, the coming up on our right is this, it became a guy who was sitting next to you on the train mm. and pointing stuff out to you in a more friendly manner, more casual manner, which I think is what made the, th the thing work. Mm -hmm. um, I had a joke in there. When I, <laughs> when I write these scripts, uh -huh. I write these scripts for... Uh, people who, I, I write the scripts for the people who are going to read them. I imagine the person sitting there reading the script. I might put something in the script that's not going to be in the show, mm -hmm. and I have no intention of putting it in the show, but I, for the people who are reading it, you know, I learned this one in uh, William Goldman's uh, script, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, is what got me into doing this, because he writes like he's talking to you. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, was, I put the joke in. I said, there across the river is Liberty Square, home of the inspiring haunted mansion, and the spooky Hall of Presidents. And we get into the recording studio, and the producer on the show is Steve Hansen, bless him, and uh, Steve says, do it. I said, <laughs> you can't put that on the train. He said, do it. So we did it, uh -huh. and we did not record an alternate take. And they put it in the EEPROM, and they put it on the train, and the executives wrote it, and it went <laughs> wow. They didn't notice it. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it stayed on the train for four or five years. Mm -hmm. And just about every day I'm told someone would come to City Hall and complain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. And, and it's so great that we had those opportunities at Walt Disney mm -hmm. World to come in through the back door because, you know, you get to see, you get to work with so many talented people, you get to see what they're doing. But not only did you do voiceovers and you were one of the original characters at Epcot, it's like you also wrote for Disney. You know, you wrote for the Disney company. So what was that like, like being able to, to write something, you know, and knowing that Walt would, he came up with these ideas and he came up with these shows and now you have that burden. Was it a burden for you to write for Disney? What was that like when you had your first job to write a show for Disney? It's scary as hell, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I think the first real, there's a thing going on at Epcot Center and this is be going on forever. Everybody wants to be Walt Disney. Mm. Everybody wants to be the guy who thinks this stuff up, mm. that has all these other people come around and makes the dream come true. And so there's, uh, at Epcot particularly, there was a community of talent. They hired so many wonderful people from all over the world. Mm. And they all wanted to be Walt Disney. And everybody was submitting scripts and trying to kick stuff upstairs. And um, so I found that, uh, you, 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 you go through these different stages. You write stuff and it gets ignored. Then you write stuff and people realize that you're good and they'll put their name on it <laughs> right. and okay. pass it around, uh -huh. you know? And um, I went through all of these stages. I finally wrote one big convention show, uh, which went to the head of uh, the guy who ran Epcot Entertainment. And uh, he recognized the show, recognized my writing. And when he left the company, he took it and we produced the show in Kissimmee as a themed dinner show. Oh, wow. um, the, the big writing thing I did for Disney was I did the uh, uh, script book for the original Streetmosphere at uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios. Okay. Um, all the street, the street characters, mm -hmm. they wanted a Bible uh, for these people who would develop the characters, come up with bits, comic bits for them to do. And um, I don't... I don't know if this is the case, but my thinking, what I surmise, what I figured out. They wanted that, that book, which I wrote, this big, thick book with all this comic stuff. They wanted that book to show to the executives 
so they could, so the executives could feel good about turning these people loose because they didn't use any of it. Mm. They brought the people in and they did improv, mm. which works once you have some, some stuff prepared. Mm -hmm. But there was a while there where they were just going up to guests and asking, uh, so what film are you going to do? Yeah, okay. Which yeah. Uh, is you know, putting it all in the guest's lap. Yeah. Um, but there were some wonderful characters there. I loved the idea of Sid Coenga, and that's really what I wanted to do with mm -hmm. Sid Coenga. Oh, the guy's like the mayor of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but so I got to do, I got to write all of that book, and uh, that, that got me known as somebody who could do writing, and I did uh, uh, the Fort Liberty show, and I did two and a half years with Chuck E. Cheese. Don't think less of me for that. <laughs> um, and that was, that was a, a very interesting experience. And, then we, and the thing is, we shot most of that at Disney using Disney talent. The oh, thing really? that you, yeah. you started to refer to before was that when you get into Disney as a performer, and people see what you can do, they start going, well, come over here. Mm -hmm. Come over here and do this event. Come over here and do this uh, parade, do this character. And you uh, apparently have done a lot of that. They, mm -hmm. they, once they got to know you, see what you could do, he's, he doesn't just carry canopies. Mm -hmm. He does yeah. other things. And, um, and that's what uh, you, your career right now is, is, has been. It has been. Spreading it out. Yeah. And I think, you know, we have a, we have a luxury of being able to perform every day where it becomes mm -hmm. your job. You know, you know, Ryan, you could talk to, 500 people every day is no big deal to you and you do it and everybody feels that you were just talking to them like you know you pointed out when you do voiceovers it's like sitting next to someone in mm -hmm. the car these are things that you understand and learn by just working every day and dealing with so many different people in your daily uh, just going out on what we call set mm -hmm. to to do a show when i was growing up i watched the johnny carson show and they'd have people like george burns and jack benny on and they'd always say the same thing they'd always say there's no place nowadays for people to go to be bad. We had vaudeville. We had mm -hmm. burlesque. We would do 12 shows a day. Mm -hmm. And you learn to polish things. You learn how to judge your audience. You know how to work situations. That's what a theme park is. Yeah. If for a performer, it is the best training ground in the world because they pump those people through there. Yeah. And our job, really, is to make this stuff look like it never happened before. Mm -hmm. 12 times a day. Exactly. Everybody I meet, it's, 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 this, whatever happens these, these people give me is, uh, when I'm doing DreamFinder, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you learn, to, I would come up with, um, there, are only so many, there are only so many ways a person meeting a wizard holding a dragon is going to react. <laughs> right, yeah. you know? Once you learn what those four or five ways are, you come up with the clever answers for three or four clever answers for each one of them, mm. and there's your material for 30 minutes. Yeah. So you go out there and it all looks completely spontaneous. And then of course what happens is people come up to me 20 years later and said, remember when you, you, woke this, you, you did this, that, the other thing to me? And I, and I go, yeah, yeah, I remember that because I did it a million times, but they have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> what other voices did you do for the company? Um, really, I'm, I'm not... Um I would say I'm not like you. I can't really do character voices. I'm kind of like the guy that you just are a character the, voice. Actually. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> the, the, the voice. You know, if if either it could be, I've done a lot of stuff for Disney's Animal Kingdom, mm -hmm. so I have that you know close to African voice, so I can go into an African voice, English accent voice. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of uh, voiceovers for Disney's Animal Kingdom. Um, so I'm more like. Uh, you know, not to say I am James Earl Jones, but I am that deep voice when you, got you need that, it yeah. for that. Yeah, so, you know, I've been blessed with that voice I can use. Um, and speaking of that, as far as, like, voices and talking, uh, you, of course, was a puppeteer as well, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you had Figment. Any, any moments with, with Figment where sometimes you didn't have to say anything and Figment would just make magical moments? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I worked with him extensively before we actually got out in front of the public because mm -hmm. I knew that... I knew that I wanted people who walked up to see us to see two minds at work. Mm -hmm. I wanted them not just to see a guy holding a puppet, but I wanted to make it look like there were two brains. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn how to, first of all, I had to learn how to aim him. Mm -hmm. Because when, with a character like that, unless his, his, the pupil of his eyes is right on you, mm -hmm. it, he looks dead. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's, he's dazed. Yeah. Um, you can usually tell when it's me in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see a picture of Dreamfinder. You know how to aim his yeah, eyes. Yeah, because Figment's looking right into the camera. Mm -hmm. Since he wasn't going to talk, uh, 
he and could he talk talked to so me. much on a ride. They, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we, they found that when they were testing him out, when they first created the puppet, they tried him out at some children's parties in California, and they found that kids loved him as long as he didn't talk, because mm -hmm. that's a scary voice. It was a high-pitched, mm -hmm. manic, scary voice. So he talked to me, mm -hmm. you know, and I learned that there were th little tricks I could do to get them to hear him. For example, um, uh, if somebody would pet him on the nose, he'd go like that. And they'd know he said thank you. Mm. <laughs> they would say, you're welcome. Oh, wow. Um, the two things I miss about Dreamfinder, one is the kids, the kids' mm. faces. And the other's having the, the figment next to me, having that dragon there. To this day, I can feel him there. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it, it, learning, to, learning to aim him without looking, without, you know, I, had to, I would ride the bus around Epcot Center and, mm. and practice on people sitting on the bus. And that's back when they had a bus that moved through the park for guests, right? The no, 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 the one bus? backstage. Oh, you used to do backstage? The one backstage. Figment. I would carry oh, yeah? Figment on, this, on the bus with oh, me. Oh, wow. And um, people would be looking at me from the bus like this, and I'd, and I'd, I'd hit him with the dragon. Mm. And I say, does it look like he's looking at you? Uh -huh. and, um, and that's how I learned how to instinctively mm -hmm. uh, aim him wow. and, and help bring him to life. And it's just, an, it's just mentally knowing when you're where your hand is. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, uh, my girlfriend loves Figment, by the way, first of all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for a while, I think there wasn't a lot of Figment merchandise. And then Figment and Dreamfinder got a rebirth. How did you feel when you saw that coming out? I don't, and I, I know you're aware that they had a whole comic book series as well. Oh yeah. There's, you know, so it had a rebirth. How did you feel about that when you saw like it coming out of Epcot and just standing on its own? It's, um, well, the character is so good. The, what, what Tony Baxter did in creating the Dreamfinder and Figment in the ride. Mm -hmm. I think the reason the Dreamfinder is remembered at all is because of this wonderful job that they did in creating that ride and telling the story of Dreamfinder creating Figment at the top of the show and mm -hmm. like that. And, and I've said this before, but uh, I don't think that you know, what we did strolling around posing for pictures is anywhere near as, as impactful as what people saw on that ride. That's why people remember Dreamfinder. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Dreamfinder did disappear in 1998. Mm -hmm. Um, he's still big in merchandise. I mean, everywhere they were sold side by side, Figment outsold Mickey Mouse, mm. uh, especially at Epcot Center. Yeah. Um, but uh, they, when they brought him back, and then they, they use him all the time. I'm, I mean, I'm not really surprised because there's, there's as they, they said on uh, The Simpsons, there's a buck to be made. <laughs> and um, I think the characters will stay alive for that. Yeah. Um, I just w watched um, this video, the one of the One Day at Disney videos from Disney Plus, um, and they're they're redesigning Figment. They're working on a new design for Figment. Wow. We don't know for what. Mm -hmm. The comic books were wonderful, though. Mm -hmm. The the guy who did those, Jim Zub, um, did a wonderful job of capturing the original relationship between Dreamfinder and Figment, because when they redid the ride, Figment became a pest. Mm -hmm. He shows up at the beginning of the ride now, and they go, "You're not supposed to be here. Go away." Mm -hmm. But Dreamfinder loved Figment, mm -hmm. cherished him, and that made him a lovable character. That's what made us like him, too. Mm -hmm. It's easy to write, be, you're, be, you're a pest, go away. It's easy yeah. to write that. So maybe with that new design, we can see, we can see some new adventures of Figment, I'm, I'm sure. I'm certainly and hoping so. You know, around the corner, Ron, I probably see a live action film or something. <laughs> Could they talked for a while doing about a 3D film with, uh, about Dreamfinder's son hmm. and Jack Black. Oh, wow. Was going to play. Well, that think would it, work. I think that, that would, would be, be fantastic. Terrible. Listen, Mark, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for doing this. This has been a terrific, uh, mm -hmm. a terrific thing for me and uh, for helping me out with the show. Well, uh, no problem. It. You know what? You know, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for, uh, it's an honor to sit with a legend. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm following your footsteps. You know, I work in the theme parks and, and trying to stretch my talents out to do other things at Walt Disney World. So, um, you, I'm, I'm enjoying the foundation people like you have built. So thank you very much. And I'll good luck what, with the show. I'll see what you can do with it. Yes, sir. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm Ron Schneider uh, saying uh, be like Mark. Follow your bliss. It's a wild ride.